Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to topic 3.3.4.2, mass transport implants from the AQA A-Level Biology specification. So this is a relatively small topic to cover. We'll first look at the xylem and how water and mineral ions are transported in plants, as well as an overview of the cohesion tension theory. We'll then move on to the phloem and how the mass flow hypothesis works and how this explains translocation in plants. Finally, we'll consider the use of tracers and ringing experiments to investigate transport in plants. The spec also wants students to be able to evaluate evidence for and against the mass flow hypothesis. So I think it's a good idea to have a look at a few examples that are out there, which could potentially come up in exams. So let's make a start. There are two types of tissue involved in transport in plants, the xylem and the phloem. Xylem is the tissue that transports water and dissolved mineral ions from the roots up the stem to the leaves. Phloem is the tissue that carries organic substances such as dissolved sucrose from the source to the sink in plants. So let's start by looking at the xylem in a bit more detail. The xylem form long hollow tubes formed from dead cells joined together. They are one way only and there are no end walls between cells. Their walls contain lignin for strength, which helps provide structural support to the plant. Before we move on to cohesion tension theory in more detail, it's important to know a few key terms. Cohesion is when water molecules are attracted to other water molecules by hydrogen bonding. The transpiration stream is the movement of water and dissolved mineral ions through the xylem vessels from the roots to the leaves. And finally, transpiration is the evaporation of water from a plant surface, especially the leaves. So let's have a look at cohesion tension theory, which is a theory as to how water and dissolved mineral ions move from the roots up the stems to the leaves in plants. First of all, water transpires from the leaves, and this reduces the water potential in leaf cells, which causes water to be drawn out of the xylem by osmosis. This creates tension, i.e. negative pressure, meaning that more water is drawn up through the xylem this is because water molecules are cohesive due to hydrogen bonding, meaning that water moves through the xylem as a continuous column. And finally, this allows more water to enter the roots by osmosis because the water potential in the root hair cells decreases. There are four main factors that affect the rate of transpiration. First of all, light intensity. A greater light intensity means that the rate of transpiration increases, and this is because the stomata open to allow carbon dioxide to diffuse into the leaf for photosynthesis, increasing the rate of diffusion of water vapour out of the leaf. Another factor that affects the rate of transpiration is humidity. The greater the humidity, the slower the rate of transpiration, and this is because there is a lower concentration gradient of water vapour between inside and outside of the leaf, so the rate of diffusion of water vapour out of the leaf decreases. Temperature is another factor that affects the rate of transpiration. The higher the temperature, the faster the rate of transpiration. This is because water molecules have more kinetic energy, so more water molecules evaporate. This creates a higher concentration gradient of water vapour between inside and outside of the leaf, increasing the rate of diffusion of water vapour out of the leaf. Also, because the water molecules have more kinetic energy, they move from a high to a low concentration more quickly, which is another reason why the rate of transpiration increases at higher temperatures. And finally, wind also affects the rate of transpiration. The more windy it is outside the leaf, the faster the rate of transpiration. 
This is because wind removes water molecules from outside the stomata, maintaining a favorable concentration gradient for water vapor to diffuse out of the leaf. So let's move on to investigating the rate of transpiration. A potometer can be used to estimate the rate of transpiration, and you may get shown a potometer in exams and then be asked to interpret data relating to the investigation. So here on the far left, we have a chute, which is drawing up water from the potometer. In the capillary tube, there is a small air bubble, and we measure how far this air bubble moves towards the plant, and hereby we can calculate how much water was drawn up by the plant. This little reservoir here is to add water back into the capillary tube to move the air bubble back again for further investigations or repeats. So we assume that the amount of water taken up by the capillary tube is equal to the amount of water lost in transpiration. However, in real life, this is not the case. And you may get asked in exams, for example, why is the amount of water taken up from the capillary tube not exactly the amount of water lost in transpiration? Well, the answer to that would be because some water is used in photosynthesis as well as hydrolysis reactions or water may enter cells by osmosis, causing them to become turgid. I think mark schemes are quite flexible on these kinds of questions. For example, I think any named example of a reaction in plants which uses water as a reagent would give you credit. Next we have the phloem and the translocation stream. The source is where sucrose molecules are formed, and this could be a photosynthesizing leaf cell or a storage organ such as bulbs and tubules. The sink, on the other hand, is where sucrose is needed, i.e. the rest of the plant. This especially applies to the roots, which can't photosynthesize as they're not exposed to any sunlight. So as part of the phloem structure, we have sieve tube elements, which are living cells that are elongated and join end to end to form long tubes through which dissolved organic substances can pass. They have no nucleus and very few organelles. There are also companion cells, which carry out the living functions for sieve cells, such as providing energy for the active transport of solutes such as sucrose. Note that it is enzymes which maintain the concentration gradient of solutes such as sucrose between the source and the sink by regulating the concentration of these solutes at the sink by hydrolyzing them. So let's move on to the mass flow hypothesis. First of all, sucrose is actively transported from the cells in the source into the phloem sieve tube elements, and this is done by the companion cells. This lowers the water potential of the phloem, causing water to enter the phloem by osmosis. This means that the hydrostatic pressure increases at the source end of the phloem because the volume of water increases. At the sink end of the phloem, on the other hand, sucrose is actively transported out of the phloem into sink cells. The water potential of the sink cells therefore decreases, and the water potential of the phloem increases, causing water to follow the sucrose into the sink cells by osmosis. This lowers the hydrostatic pressure at the sink end of the phloem. Overall, this creates a pressure gradient between the source and the sink end of the phloem. This means that fluid is forced from areas of high hydrostatic pressure at the source to areas of low hydrostatic pressure at the sink. And it is this pressure gradient that pushes solutes such as sucrose towards the sink. Next, we'll have a look at evidence for the mass flow hypothesis. First of all, we have ringing experiments. Here, a ring of bark, which includes the phloem, not the xylem, is removed from a woody stem. A bulge forms above the ring due to pressure being applied from above, meaning that sucrose accumulates in the phloem. The concentration of sucrose in the phloem above the bulge is greater than that below the bulge. This suggests that sucrose moves down the phloem. Next, we have radioactive tracers. 
In this investigation, a plant is supplied with carbon dioxide containing radioactive carbon-14. This is often only one leaf surrounded by an airtight container in which the carbon dioxide only contains radioactive carbon. The radioactive carbon is then incorporated into glucose when the plant photosynthesizes, and this glucose is then converted into biological molecules such as sucrose. The radioactive sucrose is then moved around the plant by translocation, and this movement can be traced using a radioactive tracer or a method known as autoradiography, where sections of the plant are removed from different areas and are then placed on photographic film. The places where radioactive sucrose is present go black. With both of these methods, we should see an overall movement of sucrose from the leaves towards the roots. However, there's also some evidence against the mass flow hypothesis. For example, organic materials have to reach sinks ranging from the roots to the flowers, so how can sap move both up and down a plant at the same time? Also, sucrose moves at a standard speed, and this speed doesn't appear to change depending on the concentration gradient. Great, so we've had a look at the xylem and the cohesion tension theory, as well as the phloem and the mass flow hypothesis. Finally, we've also looked at traces and ringing experiments, as well as some evidence against the mass flow hypothesis. That would be it for now. Thanks guys for watching. If you have any ideas or suggestions, just post them down below. Subscribe, comment. Next time we'll be moving on to a new unit in our specification, which is 3.4. This is all about genetic information, variation and relationships between organisms. See you then.